So, as you can probably tell, we're doing something a little different today. Uh, we are having a dialogue sermon. And um, though we have prepared, we have not practiced. Uh, so this is an in-the-moment, hopefully led by the Spirit, uh, creation, a happening, you might say. Uh, we uh, did the same thing in our previous two services, except, and this is very much inspired by uh, the Reverend Dr. Mark Jefferson, who was with us a few weeks ago, our guest preacher who's on a worldwide preaching tour uh, uh, for Virginia Theological Seminary. Uh, he preached a different sermon at each of the three services he, he did with us because, you know, we have three texts, three readings, uh, aside from the psalm. So he took one for the 745, a different one for the 9 o'clock, and then yet another one for the 11.15. So inspired by that, we um, have had, three diff we've had two different conversations. We're about to have the third. Uh, so this one is on the gospel that we just heard. Um, the famous story of Thomas's doubt and then confession of belief. So uh, we talked about, you know, how this always appears on the second Sunday of Easter. So, Jesse, any insider thoughts and to, as to why? Because there's a lot of variation in our lectionary usually from year to year, but this is a constant. This never changes. So what's with that? Yeah, I, I was trying to do, like, actual learning about why, and no matter what year it is, it is always John 20. It's always this reading on Easter 2. Which is kind of funny because it's always the week that the associates and assistants have to preach because the rector <laughs> preached the week before. So I've actually preached this text probably more than any other hmm. in the whole lectionary because wow. of how it falls and when it yeah. comes. And I don't know what was happening in the room um, when the decision was made that would always be John 20 for Easter 2, but I, I find myself having like gratitude every Easter 2 when we get the inclusion of doubt so explicitly um, mentioned and this acknowledgement from scripture that not everybody experienced the resurrection the same way, not everyone experiences Jesus the same way, um, and there's this incessant, which comes across when you hear it, Jesus does not give up. Like, he comes at the night, it's the night that he mm -hmm. rose, that's the night we're talking about. So, like, in our calendar, it would have been last Sunday night. And what a day Jesus has had. <laughs> and then he shows yeah. up, and the doors are locked, and he goes in. And then uh, he goes back a week later, which would have been in our time, like, tonight, he goes back. Mm -hmm. And they're still locked in the room. And he keeps going back and keeps offering, saying, peace, peace be with you. And I just imagine that even through all the centuries, um, this response of the resurrected Jesus is um, not so much us seeking him or our call story, but like our finding story mm -hmm. of Jesus finding us. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what you discovered in your reading about why, why they deemed it so that we would read this every year. I have no insight into the lectionary <laughs> decisions. I came up empty on Somebody that, Somebody can tell us later. <laughs> um, but, I mean, there's so much that makes this a good yeah. second Sunday of Easter reading. I mean, again, like you said, at least the, the part where Thomas is there, where he sees Jesus, yeah. that, that's today. So just the calendar, that makes sense. But also, um, yeah, I think it's so helpful to be reminded year after year that um, resurrection isn't only hard for us to believe as yeah. modern people living 2,000 years later in a different place and different culture. It was always hard to believe. Um, we see this in this story where Thomas, you know, hearing the testimony of his friends, people he's been living with, uh, uh, really um, in a very intentional way for, um, you know, one to three years, so however long Jesus' ministry was, he doesn't, he won't take their word for it. He has to see it. He has to touch it himself. Um, I was looking at a, a commentary on John written by a, a Jungian who is also an Episcopal priest, and he said that Thomas was what, you know, uh, in, in Jung's personality typing, which later became Myers-Briggs, uh, he would be like a sensation type. Mm, definitely. Um, and it, like the author of John seems to be more of like an intuitive type. Totally. Um, but there's so many of us, like unless we see it and ha encounter it in some concrete way, uh, can't believe it. Uh, and you see the, 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 the hardness of, of, of believing in the resurrection in the other Gospels, but I'll spare the details. But I mean, in Matthew, you have Jesus appearing to a crowd and a bunch of people bowing down, but some doubted. It's yeah. just like there. So 
I think that's good to, to be faced with. But also, what Jesus does, I mean, these are people who have kind of deserted him, mm-hmm. right? Like Peter denies him three times, the rest of them scatter, except for the beloved disciple who yeah. comes off pretty good in, in John's gospel. Uh, you yeah. know, he's, he beats Peter to the tomb. Yeah. He doesn't leave Jesus at the cross. He's there with, with Mary and, and the other women who are much more heroic in the gospels than the men. Um, but the rest of them are like, they kind of screwed up. Yeah. You know, they, they let Jesus down when it really mattered. Um, and what does he come and say to them? Peace be with you. Yeah, I, I, it's the restoration yeah. of relationship, yeah. too. I mean, I think all of us, all, maybe not to the level of, like, Peter and some of the disciples, but we've done something in a relationship where we're like, I really wish I had never said that mm-hmm. um, and, or had never done that. And then that is, like, what we're left with. That's the taste that lingers in our mouth. And for here, we get the disciples in such, I, such a spiral of shame, I imagine, and then Jesus speaking peace first to them. Like, there's so many first words Jesus could have said after what he's gone through and what they did to him, Um, and the first thing to be peace. Uh, One of the things I heard this week as I prepared that I just, I I hadn't heard this about Thomas, because so much it's doubting Thomas. Like, it's even called sometimes doubting Thomas Sunday. And I heard, this kind of goes with your Jungian, interpretation that what Thomas did that day was asked for what he needed, which I just, I loved that. And I love that in, in our relationships with each other, human to human, in our relationship with God, that you don't, uh, he, he doesn't, like, he doesn't take people's word for it, and you can interpret he needs the sense. But he knew himself well enough to be like, no, I actually, I know what I need, and I'm going to ask really vulnerably ask my community for what I need, and then I'm going to ask my God for what I need. And I think about that for us in our lives of faith and in our interpersonal relationships, how we might actually model Thomas in that that self-clarity that he offered in his faith. I think that presents such a great model for prayer. Yeah. Um, it's, It's such a common thing, you know, I think we as clergy here and have thought and sometimes continue to think ourselves, maybe if, if I'm not all that uh, unusual, uh, that, you know, I don't have to have things figured out uh, or settled to approach God, to talk to God, to uh, relate to God, that um, the, the reality of who I am at any given moment, uh, the things that don't sit right in terms of the, the understanding I have of God and the reality of my life in the world and what's going on, uh, you know, whether it's war or the messiness of the church or whatever it is, um, that to, to, go with, to go to God and to our companions in Christ with um, honesty about, you know, this is where I am. I want to be, you know, uh, full of faith and uh, conviction. But right now, I'm X. Right now, I need this. Um, beautiful. Very healthy. And I yeah. think also the other piece of that that Jesus models for us related to that is his, the woundedness mm-hmm. of, yes. his resurrect, yes. of his resurrected body and what that says for us and our bodies and this church that we have, that Jesus could have come back with the wounds gone and mm-hmm. healed, and instead... Uh, he comes back with the marks of the crucifixion on him as a testament of what he has been through and also the path through which Thomas will walk to find faith and say, my Lord and my God, it's through those wounds. Amazing detail, you know, um, absolutely amazing. Yeah, and it says so much about how, you know, on our journeys to whoever it is that we are becoming, um, you know, in the divine plan or economy, all this stuff that maybe God didn't will for us necessarily, the hardships, the the suffering, um, the loss, uh, yet it's all part of of God making us, um, you know, the the people that that we're called to be, Uh, saints, basically. And we talked about this in um, earlier uh, conversations today, that um, you know, in the, the writings and thought of the early church, you know, when you're baptized, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you, be, you become Christ, uh, a, a little Christ, maybe like a lower cap, lower case C. To be but, clear, to be clear, right. little but, Christ. But still, <laughs> you know, still very much a Christ, because that means the anointed one. We're all anointed with oil and baptism. We are all um, part of Christ's body. Uh, 
And so that is who God is calling us to be, but there's so much you know, stuff that does not seem to be helping us become that in our life. And, and this is saying that, the, 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 that Jesus still bears the wounds, that you know, our, our wounds um, can make us exactly uh, the sorts of um, anointed ones. Uh, uh, that we are, and that, that we're, we're called to live more and more into the fullness of. Um, that's, yeah. Also, a lot of good psychology in this. A lot <laughs> so, of good psychology. And I think the last thing to verse, say about it yeah. is, uh, this is actually the Johannine Pentecost story. It um, is, yeah. So, uh, Johannine, fancy word for, from the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where, like you're saying, the Holy Spirit, this is where the disciples received the Holy Spirit and were sent out to do that work. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, th I think for all of us in our broken, wounded bodies and souls, uh, this message today that Jesus is going to find us um, in, in our, whatever state we're in, even if we're hidden, um, and that if we can find the words to ask for what we need, and even if we can't, we're still going to receive the breath and the mm -hmm. peace of God that will guide us to what's next. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, and to that, I mean, that Jesus breathes on them. Not a COVID-safe <laughs> practice really here, differently now. but uh, receiving the breath of life. I mean, it's like God breathing life into the nostrils of Adam in, yes, in Genesis. Same word, exact same yeah, word. Yeah, it's, it's a new creation that's going yeah. on here. Uh, the fact that, you know, uh, like when we don't know the words to say, we can just pr pray with breathing. I mean, that's mm. uh, in many ways the practice of meditation, just like sitting to be with what is. Uh, and you know, one breath in, one breath out. Um, that can be a great meditation, a great prayer when we don't know what to say, when we you know, need the Holy Spirit to pray with groans too deep for words. Um, to have that as an image of Jesus just breathing in um, the breath of life and therefore making us one with him, really, you know, um, is, uh, is um, I think, a beautiful meditation. Um, so um, should we close with a prayer? Sure. Okay. Let us pray. God, in this Easter season, may we become still enough. May we take the time to be still before you, where we can receive the inflow of your breath, of your life, of your being, of your love that we so desperately ache for and need. Make us like Thomas, people who can be honest, vulnerable, self-aware, people who can reach for and ask for what we need from you and what we need from one another. As we move into this season of rejoicing, of celebration, of resurrection, may we, may we be reminded by the wounds that Jesus still bore that nothing is wasted on our path to you and to the fullness of life that you call us to. Amen. Amen.